Now, Claudia, you have finished your clerkship with Justice Harbison, and I know it was one of the best, a one-year clerkship? Yes. One of the best years of your legal career. I know that it was. And uh, did you immediately go back home to practice with Billy, or did you have another job in between? I went back to practice with Billy, and then I was offered a job as an assistant district attorney in charge of child support. I did that for six months, and I did not like it. It was too confrontational for me. Mm -hmm. And I know that may sound strange being from a lawyer, but um, the, the clients were, the, the office was in a total mess. We hadn't had any ERISA claims filed in more than two years. It was stacked up everywhere. ERISA is the interstate compact for collecting child support when parents live in different states. And um, and so I had to, I, I cleaned up that mess and after I'd done that, I just decided I, I've, I've done enough and, and I'm, I'm going to practice law. How many cases want. did you dispose of or, or handle, uh, get into the pipeline during that period of months? I, I think about 800. Just a mere 800. <laughs> well, I mean, you do what you have to do. That's you, right. You've got to clear out those, close those files. So are you saying that you practiced with Billy for a while and then went to the district attorney's office and then came back to practice with came Billy? Came back. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided, Billy and I talked about it, and I told him, I said, I don't think that it would be a good idea for the first time somebody comes into your office or for a returning client to stare at me because they've come to see you. You're the one with the established practice. And so we rented the office across the hall just directly, and I had a sign on my door that said, Billy Jack across hall <laughs> on my door. And it was the most wonderful office because I looked right out on the courthouse. I could see everything that was going on. And, um, and he had his domain um, where he'd always had it with his secretary and his routine. And I didn't interfere with that, and he would feed me questions to research for him. Um, and occasionally he would refer a client to me. And then the, the very first case I had was referred to me by the city judge, and he asked me if I would represent a client in a criminal case, and I said, of course send him over here. And so um, I didn't have an appropriate place to interview somebody, and this was a stranger, and I was new at it, and so I was a little uncomfortable. So I asked Bill if we could use his office. I really liked to sit, it's been my practice, to sit next to my client, at least in the first interview or so, so that when I'm writing whatever they're telling me, they can look over there and see what I'm writing and they won't be thinking that I'm writing something derogatory or frivolous about them. So that's just been the way mm -hmm. I practice. Well, this man came in, and he was, um, he had on a baggie on his head. <laughs> I mean a real baggie, not a shower cap, but a baggie, like <laughs> a sandwich bag, maybe a little larger. And he had a toothpick in his mouth. Well, that's not uncommon in our part of the country for men to go around with toothpicks. Anyway, he took the baggie off of his head, which I appreciated, <laughs> and he took the toothpick out of his mouth, which I also appreciated, but then he wove it into his beard. And I had never seen anything like that. And I said, if you'll pardon me for just a minute, and I went out and Billy was in the filing room, and I said, Billy, I don't think I can do this. And I told him what happened. He said, you need to remember what Justice Harbison taught you and play like he's right there by your side, and you go in there and act like the professional you are and represent that man. And I thought, oh, okay. So I did. And <laughs> we went to trial two days later, and I won the case. I don't know how I did it. He was, he was charged with body slamming his girlfriend into a bathtub. Now, I did not know what body slamming meant, but it is a wrestling term for, I guess, picking somebody up, 
full body and, and throwing them it. on the yeah, ground. like wrestlers do <clears throat> on television. And when the alleged victim came into the city court, she was wearing the tightest shorts I'd ever seen on a human being, and great big pink rollers in her hair. Now I don't know if that had a thing to do with winning the case. I'm. I'm sure it was my eloquence, but <laughs> <laughs> but I did win the case, and so that was nice to be able to put that little feather in my cap that I won my first case. That was a good start. Yes. Well, uh, at the time then, Billy was no longer with Mr. McFarland's firm? He Mr. Was... McFarland had retired, mm -hmm. and for, <clears throat> um, for a time, Billy and Jerry practiced together in the old Herald Building. Um, on West Seventh, no, on um, South Garden Street, and uh, then when I came back, Billy and I set up office. He had had a couple of young lawyers in there in the interim, and um, but anyway, I came back and practiced across the hall for him from him for maybe 12, 15 years. Were you the first woman lawyer in Columbia? No, there were already two. Oh. And now there are more. Did you all form a bond? With the other women? Yes. Well, of course, Barbara Walker was down at the end of our hall. Her father owned the building we were renting and um, renting the offices mm -hmm. from. <clears throat> and um, we became fast friends. That's good. And what kind of law did she practice? Mostly um, uh, family law. Mm -hmm. Now, corporate law. Uh, you had been very active in the Columbia community and socially in church and as a lawyer's wife, um, civically and so forth. You, you had, had uh, been active in many ways in the Columbia community and in the legal profession. You were, you were known, you were active as a lawyer's wife. What was it like then to suddenly be a lawyer in the Columbia legal community? and be, be dealing with people on a professional basis uh, or even be in a position to give them instructions or uh, you know, give orders to people when you had only known them socially before. How did people react to you and how did you feel about that? Well, of course, I didn't give my friends any orders. Uh, I mean, well, but people in the courthouse, for example, had been your friends or people in the bar and their wives and a couple of husbands maybe had been your friends and, and suddenly you were uh, exercising authority perhaps or negotiating with them professionally, for, you know, for filling a different role than you ever had before. I filled a different role but I didn't do it with my friends. My friends weren't my clients <laughs> and um, I, I had asked for a leave of absence from the garden club when I went to law school mm -hmm. and they said there bylaws didn't provide for a leave of absence that I would have to resign and then rejoin. So I rejoined the Garden Club mm -hmm. after maybe four years of practice. Uh -huh. I had to be careful because I was just one person and we had three children and a grandfather and Billy in the home and I was still cooking dinner every night and you know re I resumed my role as a homemaker and <clears throat> A role I enjoyed and um, just had to, to balance it. I'm sure I wasn't as good a lawyer as I could have been, but I, I also wasn't um, having the pressures of rising through the ranks of a law firm. Um, I mean, Billy wasn't going to fire me, I didn't think. <laughs> I mean, he could I have. Mm -hmm. He could have said, this is not going to work out. I was very respectful of his time and his clients, and, um, and I needed his advice in the law. Mm -hmm. And we just managed to make it work. It was never really an issue. And he had big clients. He represented State Farm and... I don't know, many, many counties, maybe 25 counties, and he represented the hospital um, and ultimately became the city attorney. So he had, he had a lot to do, and he was the main breadwinner. And, um, and I, did, I did what I could and 
my practice grew. You know, in a small mm -hmm. town, you represent a member of a family and you do a really good job for them. Well, then they tell a relative, and pretty soon you're representing the whole family. You're the family lawyer. If it's, if it's something that you want to do. And I did a variety of things mm -hmm. and took, of course, took criminal appointments whenever they were. Um, whenever the judge called and was happy to do that. I enjoyed that part. I never sought compensation for that. I felt mm -hmm. like it was a learning process and I Certainly. did learn a lot and the judges appreciated it and that made me even more popular with the, you know, sure. legal system. Well, still, uh, in dealing with other lawyers who had been your social friends before as a, as a lawyer's wife and a member of the community, um, you might suddenly be in an adversarial role. Um, you, surely you had to deal with, with other lawyers and with, with people in the legal community and support staff and people in the court clerk's offices and so forth in a different way than you had before. They knew you in a different, you were wearing a different hat. I was, I was with them in a different capacity, but um, I don't know how it is up here in the city as opposed to <laughs> where I live. But our bar is very collegial, very. And business was business, and pleasure was pleasure. Mm -hmm. And we worked hard and we played hard. But when we had a case, in most of the cases where you would have opposing counsel that was local would be in a custody matter or a divorce, um, some family matter really more than business. And um, I learned a lot about insurance defense. I learned a lot about hospital law. I learned a lot about city law. I didn't like it too much because it was mostly about sewage. <laughs> and I got tired of researching that. But basically, I was open to learning anything and, and just did it. And it was not hard, really, to balance. You know, you can't do everything at one time. True. You have to pick and choose what your priorities are at that moment, and they may change more than one time in a day. When something is really urgent, you do give it most of your attention. And Billy and I both understood that and made allowances for that. But of course, I had the children, and they were my primary responsibility. So most of the time, that um, came first, and they understood when I couldn't be there. But it wasn't that often. Did you ever feel that you were treated differently uh, as a woman lawyer? No. I, n I never felt, no, I never did. Mm -hmm. um, my friends who were prominent lawyers at that time um, were very respectful and generous in their time and answering questions. and you know, guiding me along. Mm -hmm. um, and when I would have a, a difficult issue to resolve, of course, I could always go to Billy. And he never, um, he never acted like he was impatient with me or, I mean, he was, he was truly, he was my mentor. Yes. Because he taught me how to deal with the clients when I would have a difficult time. And he taught me a lot about the law and how to find things. I remember he always told me, he said, when I'd, I'd get something and I'd ask him a question, he'd say, Claudia, read the statute. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yes, I remember that from law school. And, um, and I'd go on about my merry way and go off on this tangent and that tangent. And finally, I would read the statute, and the answer was almost always right there. He was mm -hmm. always right. And he, he also had another habit of when he had a, um, a responsibility, um, like drafting a motion or a complaint or anything, he just sat down there with his pen and his legal pad and wrote it out. And he didn't hesitate. Me, I'd have to stew and brew about everything. And, you know, want to get it just right. He just sat down there and did it. I remember he was at home for a good length of time one time, and Edward was, or the baby, was there. And he picked up 
Billy's recording machine. <laughs> and he said, I, I heard him say, and I saved the tape, take this letter in the suitcase of, and then he would give a name, <laughs> and then he would go on just like he was dictating uh -huh. a letter. I thought that was so cute, take this letter in the suitcase. <laughs> That is. Um, now, did did your practice extend to counties other than Murray County? Oh, for sure. Wherever anybody called me. In fact, I went down to um, Hohenwald one time, and the judge down there, um, who was a Franklin judge, um, oh, I wish I could remember his name, but anyway, he, he appointed me to a case. Well, it turned out that my client shinted down the drain pipe and escaped from the jail, which was on the third floor of the courthouse there in Hornwall. And when I came back, Judge, um, for when he, you know, failed for his escape, he said, "What are you doing representing this man?" I said, "Well, Judge, you appointed me." He said, why would I do a thing like that? I said, I guess I was the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, you did appoint me. And, um, and he said, now why should I listen to you about anything? I said, Judge, I don't know, but have you ever been up there in that jail? And he said, no, I haven't. I said, well, I'd like to invite you because it's about 130 degrees up there. And you can understand why somebody in desperation might want to shinny down the <laughs> drain pipe. Well, he didn't buy my argument, and, and the man suffered for it, but I didn't, I had not given him those instructions to. You hadn't told him to escape? No, I had not. I would never. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, so you, uh, you took criminal cases and uh, domestic relations cases? Oh, yes. Um, did you handle any death penalty cases when you were in private practice? Yes. We had we represented a client named Bobby Howell, who was accused of um, setting a fire to a residential nursing home. Some residents, some people could get a license to run a nursing home in a private residence. Yes, and um, they weren't very well supervised, and they didn't have to meet all of the specifications that a really mm -hmm. corporate new nursing home would have. And anyway, um, our theory was that one of the gentlemen who lived there had a real affection for cigarette lighters and that accidentally set his bed on fire and burned it. I don't know what happened. I do know that Billy quoted Mr. Howell's family a fee that he was sure they would not accept. And we learned a valuable lesson there because sometimes they will. Sometimes they're willing to pay what you ask. And we um, ended up spending years on that case and, and losing money. But we did keep here, Mr. Howell from, the, from being executed. And I firmly believe that the reason he was given life was that the jury would have had to deliberate over the 4th of July holiday. Oh and so they met and came to a decision very quickly after they had found him guilty. And, um, and he, he, sir, he, he died in jail, in the penitentiary. Mm. Um, how have you seen the domestic relations practice change? When I first practiced law, I might see one or two domestic assault cases a year. And now those cases are rampant. Now, um, and there's a great outcry to do something about it, to pu punish the perpetrators. Um, our policemen are under a duty to, when they investigate a domestic assault complaint, to find the primary aggressor. And they do that usually by asking the two people who've been in a disagreement. And 
they have to arrest somebody. So frequently when you get to court, they've had a meeting of the minds and they don't want their spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend, or whatever it is, the, you know, the parameters have expanded as mm -hmm. to what is a family member or what is a household member. And, um, and so they don't want to prosecute. And then we have a, a very um, sticky situation with the district attorney because, of course, they want their statistics to reflect that they've taken this seriously mm -hmm. and fallen to the end. And we, um, we just, ha it's a very, it's a very troubling issue that we face. I've never seen so much violence, but I guess families have more stresses than they ever had. That's the only ex explanation I can give. Um, well, eventually you decided to leave private practice and run for public office. When was that and, and what was going on that, that caused you to decide to leave private practice? Okay, thank you for asking that question. I had substituted for Judge Ed Workman in Mount Pleasant as General Sessions judge really for about 10 months, I think. He was not well and he wanted to keep his position and so I sat for him. I'm not even sure it was re legal, but it, I guess it was. I wouldn't have done it. But, um, and then when he retired, I ran for that judgeship because I enjoyed it. Didn't think I'd ever want to be a judge and haven't thought so since. <laughs> but anyway, I ran against Ed Ewing. Very, very congenial race, if you can imagine. Uh, I didn't know that he was related to three quarters of the people in Murray County because he was a descendant of the Campbells. James Campbell Parr, Jeep Campbell was a big political um, figure and anyway, I lost. And one of my friends, um, Miss Hickman, convinced me that I should run for the public defender's office. And I said, I just lost a race. I don't think I can win this. She said, yes, you can, and you can do this job, and we need it. And it, there was an incumbent, and there was another opponent. So there, it was a three-way race and a four-county race. Well, I was going to ask you, when I introduced this tape, I mentioned the 22nd Judicial District. So yes. tell us what counties are in the 22nd District. The counties are the, are the same as our circuit judges mm -hmm. ride their circuit. It's mm -hmm. our circuit. And it is comprised of Giles, Lawrence, Murray, and Wayne counties. Wayne County is further away from Murray than the others. Mm -hmm. It's 60 miles away. Um, Lawrence is 33, Pulaski's 31, and um, of course I'm home in, in Murray County. Um, but that's our circuit, and we ride the circuit with mm -hmm. the judges. Um, our judges right now are on a, circuit judges are on a year rotation, and then each county has its own general sessions judge, except for Murray, and they have two, one mm -hmm. in Mount Pleasant and one in Columbia. So we have nine courts that we serve. But um, Ms. Hickman encouraged me and... Now tell us, tell us who Ms. Hickman was. Ms. What was what was her position to be encouraging you to run and... Well, and she was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And she knew that Billy was getting sicker and sicker. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I should say, his health was declining. And she just, she encouraged me. Mm -hmm. And with that little support, um, I ran a Fort County race. And it's a lot of territory to cover. Yes. Now, we did not, until this year, we've never had um, party affiliation to be an issue. This year, we had our first Republican primary in Murray County. And every, every year prior to that, we, we have run as no party. You did didn't, not didn't run, matter what your party affiliation was. Did you didn't run declare under, it. No party label at all. No party label. Completely whatsoever. nonpartisan. No, it, neither the judges nor the public defenders nor the district attorneys. Mm -hmm. This has been a, a very big change for us this year. But um, 
And this year I ran as an independent, as did the other judges. Mm -hmm. The, so when you first ran, you did have opposition, but, but it was all in the general election? There was not a primary? Correct. And it was, oh my goodness, you had such a large territory to travel and campaign. Um, but I went everywhere. I ate fish and chicken stew and <laughs> whatever, barbecue and hot dogs and hamburgers, um, where, wherever I was invited or wherever, mm -hmm. wherever I was allowed to just like, when you, just like when you first moved to Columbia, if they invited you, you would go, I right? would go, yes, I would, and I meant to win, and I did win. And I've been, the, I served eight years, and then I had no opponent the next term, so I have been the district public defender for 16 years, and I had no opponent this year, so I'll serve another eight years. Good for you. Did you uh, enjoy the campaigning and the, the speech making and handshaking and being in parades and whatever you did to campaign? Well, I was only in one parade, <laughs> and the that was the parade. Mule Day Parade, <laughs> and it rained. And I had on a red jacket, and the little children, the children were on my float. And I, I had a, um, a man who owned a flatbed, and he, he had a big sign on the side. We're pulling for Claudia oh. Jack. It was so cute. And the Perfect. children would say, vote for Claudio. She's the best, clap, clap, <laughs> um, all the way through the parade route. But it rained, cats and dogs. And I had on a red jacket, of course, mm -hmm. patriotic. And everything I owned was red after that parade. <laughs> and I said, I'm never doing that again. But yes, it was fun to see the character of the different communities. It's amazing, and meeting the people, and they're so warm and friendly, and and appreciate the fact that you have come to see them, oh, and yes. and that that I thought that they were, I guess that they felt I thought they were important enough mm -hmm. to meet them in person. Mm -hmm. it was a it was a very good experience. I'm glad I didn't have to do it the other two times, but <laughs> campaigning is hard work. It is. It's tiring, isn't it? Yes, it is. But very satisfying. Very satisfying, especially if we win. That's always nice. And see, I think because I already had an established base mm -hmm. when um, Ed Ewing and I opposed each other for the General Sessions judgeship, mm -hmm. there was never an ill word spoken. Mm -hmm. we, um, we respected each other, and our our message to the voters was we're both qualified and we just happen to both want the same job and it's your decision you to choose which one. You just need to pick out one. whom to vote for. Yes. So, but, but that gave you perhaps a, a stable of volunteers and supporters and, and so forth when you ran well, for public Well, and name defender. recognition. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Are there differences among the counties in your judicial district? Every Every county is different, and then some of the communities in the other counties are, are different. Um, they have different needs and interests, and um, really the complexion of each mm -hmm. county is different. And of course, when what I see through public defender's eyes uh, is that the crimes vary. Oh. I mean, they're the same crimes. Mm -hmm. A crime is a crime, mm -hmm. it's a statute. But you'll have pills of the big drug in one county, mm -hmm. methamphetamine is a big drug in another county, um, killing and burning is one in another <laughs> county, marijuana is one in another county, cocaine's one, everything is, it just seems like they, um, um, concentrate on one drug or another more than others. And and why is that? I have no idea. <laughs> I have just, no just idea. What's trendy in the, in the locality? Huh? I don't know. I have never been anywhere where drugs were present that I knew of. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never seen anybody shoot anybody. I've never seen anybody have a big old fight. I mean, and I get around. I bet you do. A lot. Mm -hmm. And I've just never seen the things that we face in um, court and the um, 
we shake our heads every day and have, have remarked often, I tell Judge Sands this all the time, we could not make up these facts. Well, I want to ask you, um, you know, let's, let's start with generalities. Well, what is the job of the public defender? What does the public defender's office do? And what kind of staff do you have? Uh, you know, what kind of manpower do you have to do the job of the public defender? Um, in two weeks, I'll have about five lawyers. Right now, I have seven. I'm supposed to have eight, but one's retiring and is on leave right now. Um, <clears throat> and we have a caseload of about 18, I mean, 11,800 cases per year mm -hmm. for that many lawyers. I have an investigator who is who died last year, so I don't have that position filled yet. And um, three secret, well, two secretaries, an office manager, and right now six lawyers. But that will improve as soon as the budgetary constraints are loosened a little bit, and we we figure it out. I think within a month I'll have all the positions filled. And we just, I go to General Sessions Court because that's where the caseload is the heaviest. And I go to circuit two, of course, but I mean, um, I go to at least two General Sessions, well, at least one General Sessions Court every week, most of the time too, because that's where you take the temperature of mm -hmm. your lawyers that are working in the office and where you get a feel for um, what the caseload is, is, and we're, um, we can filter out the cases that absolutely do not need to go to circuit court, because if all those cases were bound over to the circuit court, we'd have a log jam we'd never mm -hmm. loosen. So um, that's a very important court, and they only have misdemeanor jurisdiction, which means that if someone's charged with a felony, um, we have to um, agree with the district attorney. We try to persuade him, actually, that this is a case that merits reducing it to a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. And they'll enter, the, the DA interviews the um, victims, and of course we interview the client. Sometimes the stories match, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, we do the best we can, mm -hmm. and, um, sure. and we solve a lot of cases. Uh, Negotiation. When you, when you say you go to General Sessions Court, are you going as an observer sometime to observe oh. your staff, lawyers, and and also you're going to handle cases yourself, or? Oh, I'm one of them. When 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 I first assumed office, we had an office meeting, and we were embarking on a weighted caseload study, which would determine whether mm -hmm. you were going to receive any new positions. Yes. And um, I told them, I said, I don't know how to be a boss. I've never been a boss. And I don't intend to be a boss. And I don't intend to micromanage your cases. You're all professionals. Many of them were, had years of experience. And I said, you do the best you can. Come to me if there's a problem. But, um, Let's just operate this office as a partnership until we reach a point, and we will reach one every now and then, where I have to assume authority and do mm -hmm. my job and correct whatever yes. needs correcting or guide you in a different direction. And so that's the way we've worked, and it's worked very well for me. It wouldn't work for everyone, but it, it does work for me, and I like to know um, how the how my how the lawyers in our office are handling their stress level because you can have too many things on your plate and it's so easy in our situation just to shift things around a little bit or when I see someone is really suffering um, from stress I'll suggest that they take two weeks and I know the first time I did that too one of my lawyers, she said, I don't need two weeks, one will be enough. And I said, yes, you need two weeks. Mm -hmm. I said, because you decompress the first week and enjoy the second week. 
and we can cover for you, and we will cover for you. And if there's anything you particularly don't want us to do for you, just let us know what it is, and we'll take care of it in that way too. So it's worked well for me. It's just a different style of management. Exactly. How might, how do you allocate your time then between management functions and handling cases yourself? I'm an emergency lawyer most of the time, and when there's an emergency, if if we've got a like next Thursday, we've got we're supposed to be in four courts, and then one of the one of our lawyers has a trial on that day too. So. I mean, we're scrambling, so I'll be one lawyer in Wayne Circuit Court, and I have convinced my secretary that she needs to go with me and uh, help me with the paperwork, and I'll do the lawyer work, and we just do it like that. Every every week is different. We have a calendar that we all look at, and no, you know, you can look ahead. Sometimes when you can look ahead and see a break, mm -hmm. that there's going to be a little break there and you'll have a little time, it makes you endure the, yes. the bad days more yes. easily. I can just get through until such and such. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, is it unusual, do you think, for the public of, uh, defender to go into the courtrooms? Do you, do you know if uh, the public defenders in other judicial districts do the same or do they stay in the office most of the time? I have what do no you think idea. is typical? I just have to manage the office the way I can keep it rolling along and be sure that our clients are well represented. When we have a, one, one luxury that I do have is that I let the client, I let the lawyers know if they have what I call a high maintenance client, one that really requires mm -hmm. a lot of time and energy. Um, if they feel that they just really can't do it or just don't want to do it, they need to let me know, and we will adjust everyone's situation. Usually I take that case. We have a lot of cases that they just call Claudia cases, uh -huh. and, it means, and, and it means that they have mental health issues. We're going to have to find placement for them, you know, uh, complications that are going to require a lot of time. Um, I do most of the cases that we get with complaints about time computation. I'm mm -hmm. on the first name basis with Janetta Kimbrough and Candace Wisman at the um, Board of Pardons and Paroles. And, um, or maybe it's something else. Anyway, they're in, they're in sentence computation. Um, I have, we have an ability in my office to work well with law enforcement. I don't say that it's perfect every day but for the most part, we have a real trust in each other, mm -hmm. and um, they know I'm not going to lie to them, and I hope nobody else in my office does that either. That's very important. And once you have established trust and a healthy respect, um, there, there's no need for things not to just move along and move along squarely. We don't always like the result, of course. Um, and we're not in charge of the result. The j judge will be the final arbiter. So yes. um, that takes some of the pressure off, knowing that it's not your decision to make, only the way you arrive, get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've talked about stress, and, and I'd like to ask you how you deal with stress, not only the demands uh, on your time, the, the caseload and uh, the scheduling and so forth, and dealing with budget issues and uh, you know the administrative issues, but also just the fact that that um, on a day in and day out basis, you are dealing with with distressing, sad, upsetting, uh, tragic situations. Um, how do you manage to? Well, I guess it's, you can't help but really like or not like some of the clients. And you cannot help the fact that you don't approve of what their behavior has led them to. But you do have control of how you respond to that. And I think as long as you remember that every 
client has a soul, just like I do. I don't want to get too religious or <laughs> smucky about this, but as long as you recognize they're a human being and that they deserve at least to be treated with human dignity, then no matter what they've done, they will realize that. And um, I don't have too many clients that are truly dissatisfied at the end of the day. Um, there are some, many sometimes. <coughs> but I think if they know that you have given your best to represent them according to the law, they know you're not a magician. They know you can't mm -hmm. change the facts. And I have to remind my lawyers every day, we don't make the facts. Mm -hmm. We take the case in front of us and we do the best we can to make sure that their rights are protected and that the result is as just as we could get it. And I don't ever give up. Yes. How many death penalties, uh, death penalty cases has your office handled since you've been public defender? Two that went to trial. Um, and the last one, um, we settled after it was set for trial. Um, and that was quite an experience because I worked with um, Bill Massey out of Memphis and Lorna uh, McCluskey out of Memphis. And that was a whole different ball game for me because we were co-counsel, they're very aggressive, um, very experienced in death penalty work. And when we have a death penalty case, it shuts our office down for a month because it's so serious, the end result can be so serious, and we must do everything. And that's what I learned from the Supreme Court experience, was building that record and how important that is. And I remember when I first became a lawyer, I went to one of the National Institute of Trial Advocacy courses. Mother and I went to Chapel Hill. She mm -hmm. thought we were going to go to research genealogy. I said, no, Mother, this is going to be <laughs> like school. She said, oh, you can't work all day every day. Well, we did. We worked all day every day and all night, and she was a juror. Anyway, the long, long and short of it is that I was fairly shy, and we had a woman there that was coaching speech patterns and things. And she told me, she said, Claudia, what you have to remember is that what's important is what's in that transcript. The written word. If you need a moment, take a breath, look down at your feet, compose yourself, and then speak. Don't speak before you're ready. It's not going to show. At the most, it'll show pause. Mm -hmm. And I've always remembered that and tried to do it because it is so true. You have to, you can't concentrate only on the moment. You must preserve your record in case you need it for the future. And um, that's probably one of the best lessons that, that I've learned. The other one is, the other lesson I've learned that is very important is get to know the custodian, <laughs> the secretaries, and the clerks, <laughs> and make sure they want to cooperate with that's you right. because that's the key in any courthouse. That's right. And, and that's true. And read the statute. <laughs> and read the statute. <laughs> yes, I'm making my list so long now, uh, I'll have to. Yes, well tell us about uh, a death penalty case you had involving a man called Angel. I represented a um, man named, uh, well he was 19 years old when we finally settled his case. A friend of his had come to his house, and I think they'd been smoking marijuana or something. I don't know. They'd been using drugs. Anyway, this other boy was upset about his ex-girlfriend talking to somebody, and he decided he'd go kill him, cut his throat. And they did. They went and cut everybody and then burn the house down. And my client was, I mean, he looked like an angel. And 
acted like an angel. He had some mental deficiencies, but nothing that would rise to a level to be a defense for him. Mm -hmm. We tried every way in the world, um, just as we had tried with Elliot Parker. But anyway, um, I didn't think if we went to trial that Angel would get the death penalty. I thought the other boy would, but you never know what will happen in trial. And we had two very talented expert lawyers from Memphis trying the other boy. And we ended up settling it on life without parole times three. That was a hard, harsh sentence, but harsh actions caused it. And I'll tell you what, um, I think I told Linda this earlier. The day that Bob Stovall, one of my lawyers, and I went to the medical examiner's office to find out exactly what we could to see if, if the wounds were actually um, lethal wounds, in, the, in other words, they would have died from those wounds, or if they were just wounds that were exaggerated because of the fire. And when the medical examiner told me that each of the victims had died of smoke inhalation, I knew we had a very bad case. So that um, I would have preferred to settle it on a few less years than life without parole, but um, we had no choice. And to go to trial and risk someone's life mm -hmm. was not worth a vanity, for sure. And you never know what juries will do, no matter how hard you work. And um, the other lawyers in the office finally had to convince me that this was the right thing to do, was settle it, because if we had gone to trial with the death penalty as a possible result, and we had received a jury verdict of life without parole, we would have paraded up and down the street with joy. But because we had a hand in that decision, it was harder for mm -hmm. me to accept. Yes, and you had uh, interaction with Angel later on, did you not? Oh, I did, before he pled, uh -huh. but after we knew that we were probably going to to do that, he asked me one day, I would, because I would go see him all the time. I think I went to see him 54 times or something like that in jail. He asked me if I could get him baptized. I said, well, I, I, I think I can. Well, I asked three ministers and they all declined. They just couldn't do it based on his actions. And we had a new priest at our church, and I asked him if he would do it, and he said yes. And so I met him at the jail, met Father Zalesak, and um, I was looking for his vessels that he would use to baptize Angel, and he didn't have any. He said, I didn't know if I would be allowed to bring them in. And I said, that's understandable. And I said, um, we'll we'll figure out something. And we used a dish pan and a styrofoam cup and had the full baptismal ceremony with a guard as a witness. And um, and then Angel asked Father Zalasak if he could sing a song he had written for this occasion. And he stood there and sang the most beautiful song. I'm sure I was emotionally moved by it, but anyway, he wanted to give something back to the Father for, for baptizing him. That's the only time I've done anything like that. But it was the right thing to do. Yes. Have you visited Angel since? Yes, I have. He's way up in East Tennessee uh -huh. in the most beautiful location, but terrible place. But he has a job in the prison. He showed me his new tennis shoes <laughs> that he had purchased, and he sends money home to his mother every month. Wow. So mm -hmm. 
you know, even in very bad circumstances, there is hope. It can be a bright spot. Well, sure. Mm -hmm. He feels productive. Um, I, I'm inferring that you oppose the death penalty. And if, if that's the case, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but uh, if, if that is the case, or what do you think would be a good alternative for the death penalty? Well, I don't want to be political in this too much in this uh, conversation we're having. I'm obligated to follow the laws of the state and the land, and I do that. But any time a punishment is significantly severe um, for the behavior, it's hard to argue that there's any punishment that is severe enough for taking another's life. Um, I just personally don't see any need for the government to take another person's life. But that's personal, and um, certainly I don't decline to take the death penalty cases and fight just as hard as I can to get a sentence less than death. Mm -hmm. And I think that if I were the district attorney and that were my job, I could fight equally hard. I'm glad I'm not in that position, but I mean, it's, it's the duty that we accept when we're sworn in. So I'll do whatever my duty dictates. Um. I'm sh having been public defender for 16 years, I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes in technology. Uh, has, has technology affected uh, the work of your office and has it made it easier or are there ways in which it's made your practice more difficult? Um, technology for us in our office mm -hmm. has improved tremendously. When I took office um, 16 years ago, the computers were sitting in the floor. Uh -huh. They did not, um, they weren't working. And so they were just sitting there. And I was appalled. And then we did the weighted caseload study, which required you to fill out a little card by hand uh, on every case that we handled. And my lawyers just said, they weren't going to do it. And I said, what do you mean you're not going to do it? We have to do it. This is the way we get more lawyers. It has to be done. So we negotiated, and I did all the cards. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't that bad. I mean, it was for a period of six weeks, and, um, and it was important enough that we had to get that job done. And the, okay. Was there, part, was there another uh, part to your I question? I thought the camera had cut off. Oh. I'm sorry. camera is still rolling. Okay. Well, right. Then I must roll, too. <laughs> the, um, the computers well, were ultimately replaced, mm -hmm. and we, were, we had an um, executive director who cared that we had adequate equipment, and we had a, um, a grant was written, and we received new computers. We have... We don't have state-of-the-art computers, but we have very, very good computers, and we just converted, um, if they finalized the negotiation, mm -hmm. from LexisNexis to Westlaw, so we have very good research engines to use for our research, because, of course, we have to do everything. We handle yes. motions, um, the trials, the appeals, post-convictions, everything. Yes. Well, I'm sure that's very helpful with uh, a, a caseload of over 11,000 cases per year. Well, we have dedicated, I have truly, truly dedicated lawyers and staff. I've been there 16 years and I've never had any internal conflict in the office, which I think is remarkable. That's quite an achievement and very special, and I'm sure your staff appreciates yes, that. Yes, it, it, it is. Of course, we don't have the volume, you know, that y'all have in these big law firms, but um, for, for those of us who work closely with each other on a daily basis, um, I chose people I liked mm -hmm. and um, that I thought 
perhaps could like me, <laughs> and it's it's worked out well, very well. Now we will let the camera take a break for change of tape. Thank you. Claudia, the job of a public defender sometimes is not popular with the public or the media, especially non-lawyer members of the public. Uh, do you ever have to deal with criticism or lack of understanding of the role of a public defender? And if so, how do you deal with that? How do you explain the importance of the role? Well, first and foremost, I don't seek publicity. And so I'm not putting my client's face in the paper. Of course, when they're charged with serious crimes, the newspaper takes care of that. And most of the time, our clients tell their story to everybody before we're even appointed. So we have that to deal with, too. But I try to keep my cases in the courthouse, in our office, and not out on the streets for public comment. I know how people feel about crime. I'm a citizen myself. I want to live in a safe society. And I think safety and good schools and economic growth in, in your communities are the three things that most of the general public are concerned about. And I have a job to do. I ran for this office. So I knew what I was getting into, and I had been a criminal defense lawyer before I ran for office and assumed this responsibility. And it is a very big responsibility, and I know that. And unless you're doing this kind of work, you might not understand that I really love it. I don't... Um, consider my clients inferior. Um, I consider my clients as human beings who've made serious errors in judgment. Sometimes it's being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and sometimes it's deliberate. But I'm not their judge. I'm what stands between them and their actions and getting a just result in punishment, if punishment is indeed deserved, or if it's appropriate under the law. And we, um, we're dealing with other human beings in the district attorney's office and in law enforcement, and I have to be sensitive to their attitudes because they're more powerful than I am. I'm not, um, by nature, a confrontational person. Um, it has served me well not to. And, but I don't have to be confrontational in order to do my job the very best I know how. And I'm proud to be a defender of the Constitution. Now, that doesn't mean that I think that the district attorney doesn't love the Constitution as much as I do. We have different roles to play, just like the judge has a different role to play. And we must all fulfill our roles to the best of our ability, lawfully. It would never occur to me to do anything illegal. It would never occur to me to change anything once it's final without going through the proper procedures. And we make mistakes, but our mistakes can be corrected. Uh, I'm very proud of the work we do. I think it's essential to our nation and our system of justice. And I don't know what else I would do if I didn't do this, because I'd really love it. That's a beautiful answer. Well, in addition to your work and your home life as a wonderful wife, mother, daughter, grandmother, and uh, your numerous contributions to the community, you have 
made enormous contributions to the legal profession and the bar. And as busy as you have been in work, in your personal life, it would be very easy to uh, simply pack your briefcase and take your purse and go home at the end of the day and let that be the end of it. But that's not what you've done. You have made enormous contributions to the profession and I'm going to list a few of those and then we'll go back and talk about uh, about each of those. But, but tell us why you consider service to the legal profession to be important. What, what has motivated you to render all this service? Well, you're making it sound like I've done some grand and glorious things, and I have not. Everything I've done has been a part of a committee or a board, um, always working with others to accomplish whatever the, the goal for that organization or commission was. Um, as I said in the beginning, I just have always loved lawyers, and I love associating with lawyers. When I started practicing, we, had, we received most of our continuing legal education through the Tennessee Law Institute, which was an organization that conducted legal education for lawyers in different sections of the state every year and brought you up to date on the law in all the law. It, you know, not not some of your specialties like patent and tax, unless it was something really extraordinary that was going on. And I always felt like it was my obligation, as nearly as I could understand, to underst to figure out and truly understand what the progression of the law was. How was it changing, and what were the what were different specialties? even though they might not be recognized as a legal specialty, professional specialty, what were, what was going on in the law? I didn't want to be confined to one area of the law all the time. I wanted to understand what other lawyers were thinking and doing. And a way to do that was to participate in bar association activities. And I served on the Tennessee Bar Association Board of Governors for 11 years because I was a district bar member and then let someone who wanted to be in the president track um, became a, a, a Middle Tennessee, that was when I was Middle Tennessee mm -hmm. governor um, and now um, I've been a governor in my, from an area in my district. Um, I've always had a tremendous amount of energy. I have less now than I used to. But if you look at the things that I participated in, most of the commissions and boards I was on happened before I became a public defender. When I became a public defender, I had to change my way of operating because I'm an elected official and I have responsibilities to the public who elected me. And so I can't go gallivanting off participating in everything that interests me on state time. It doesn't work that way. My first duty is to my constituents to be the best public defender and have the best office that I can. And so that's goal number one. Everything else has to follow in a different, with a different emphasis. I do think that elected officials, whether you're the district attorney or a judge or a um, public defender or even a private lawyer, I think it's important for the community to see you visible, participating in things other than your job. I always, I mean, I have said for years and years, as long as I've been practicing, you will hardly find a company, a board, an activity in your community, even if it's coaching or whatever it is, that doesn't include 
lawyers because they're civic-minded, they have children, we have the same interests as parents and citizens as everyone else. And so it's a natural following that you would participate in those things. I was on um, several Supreme Court commissions, and I think, I don't know this, but I think that I was asked to participate as a member of those commissions. Number one, that the Supreme Court was appointing, and I knew the Supreme Court justices. That could not hurt. I had a reputation with them. And in addition to that, um, I'm from a rural district. And it is important on many of these commissions and organizations to have representation from the rural areas. Not that we don't do the, have the same quality of product in our work, but we live in different kinds of communities than you do when you're in a big city. We have fewer resources at our disposal for the most part. Um, we, we are more hands, I don't mean, I'll, I'll get in trouble for this, but <laughs> we are, I'm so hands-on with my clients and with my staff. And as you increase the numbers, you can't be as personal, I don't think. I think it would be very difficult. And it's very easy for me. So, and I care about what's going on in other areas of the law, and I care about our profession. Um, and if I can play some small part in making it better, well then I feel like I'm obligated to do that. Plus I love it. I love associating with the lawyers from across the state in, on different um, tasks. And there's a great satisfaction um, that returns when you have done something well and made a, a real improvement in the, in the law and the way we practice. And you're about to start a new term as a public defender. What do you hope to accomplish in your next term? Well, I hope that the budget will allow us <laughs> to have a few more lawyers. And um, our equipment is, is good. We, we just need more people to address the heavy caseload that we have. I know Judge Sands, who is a General Sessions mm -hmm. judge there in Murray County, he posted on his board outside the courtroom one time where well, we had over 100 cases in one day. Now, in Murray County, we have a dedicated day for General Sessions Court and a dedicated day for Circuit Court where a private bar can come in on conflicts, but we have so many cases that they, they dedicate the day for public defender cases. And that helps a lot because we don't have to sit around and wait yeah. on a lot of other things to go, and we need the partnership with the other lawyers if they're being appointed to our conflict cases. So did I answer your question? Yes, I think so. <laughs> okay. I think so. Now, um, let's go over some of the particular uh, activities you have been involved in in the okay. profession uh, so that people will know uh, even just the tip of the iceberg of what you've done. Uh, you've been on the TBA, Tennessee Bar Association Board of Governors uh, for, yes. you said, 10, 11 years. And uh, the hallmark uh, that I shared in that one, in mm -hmm. that particular service, was when John Tarpley was president. And we went to Washington to be sworn in by the U.S. Supreme Court which, oh my goodness, that was such an experience. I just still can't get over the fact that I did that. And two of my children went with me because they said, Mother, you go everywhere by yourself. We're going to be there with you. And it was a grand experience. That's lovely. But while I was on the board of governors, uh, and we were on a bus coming, going back to the hotel, and John said, if there's one thing I could do for you to make you happy as president of the bar, what would it be? I said, give the public defenders a vote. 
on the Board of Governors. Now, the district attorneys had always had a vote, as well they should, but we were a baby to them. We came along much later. We've always had district attorneys, but you haven't always had public defenders. We're a relatively new breed. And there was a very legitimate argument that you didn't that the bar didn't want to have too many seats on the Board of Governors that weren't elected because the Board of Governors is elected by the lawyers in their particular districts. And I understood that, but it didn't make any sense to me that we would sit there at every meeting and be restricted by being a non-voting member. And I had made a couple of um, speeches to the board about it and the time was right and the next time we took a vote we we were successful in having a voting seat on the board. And I'm very proud of that. I should say so. Then the Tennessee Lawyers Association for Women. Oh, that was so funny. You know, you think you're out there practicing law, why do you need a separate association? But we had no visibility to speak of, no united visibility. And so a group of us, I'm sure I was asked because I wouldn't have thought of it, but um, people like Sissy Daughtry and Margaret Bem and you and many other women that were, Mary Jo Middlebrooks, and, um, I'll leave a whole lot out so I'll stop <laughs> there, but um, we felt like we needed a voice in the in the bar, and by having a specialty bar there for women, um, to which men were welcome That's as right. members always. It was not a gender exclusive at all. But that there might be sometimes that issues needed an extra voice, and we wanted to provide that. And I think we have. And you were president of T-Law. Yes. The um, Tennessee Supreme Court Commission on Continuing Legal Education and Specialization. The years that I served on that particular commission, we established uh, criteria for specialization so that you could specialize in an area of the law and advertise it. Before that time, only patent law and uh, tax law, tax law mm -hmm. were considered specialties, and there'd be a disclaimer that you had to put at the bottom of any advertisement you had, that you were not advertising yourself as a specialist in mm -hmm. this. But. And so it was really brought about by advertising, and we wanted the public to know what they were getting. And so by having this specialization, and we went all over, we traveled a good bit in, to other states who were wrestling with this same issue and finally came out with um, what I thought was a very good solution. It, it requires testing and um, approval by, um, not just by your peers, but professional organizations. And, um, and now we have specialists in the law. And I think we, at the end of my term, I believe it was in 96, I can't remember. Anyway, that we had uh, nine specialties other than mm -hmm. tax and patent law. And you so served, I was very proud of that. You served as vice chairman yes. of that organization. Yes. The Tennessee Supreme Court Alternative Dispute Resolution Commission. Yes, that was a um, brand new idea to have um, mediators people who were neutrals try to help clients work out their differences. And we felt that if we were going to have certified neutrals, which now we call Rule 31 mediators, um, that we needed specifics, specific requirements, so that the public wouldn't be misled by someone just claiming to know how to sit down and help people work out their issues, but that they had to have continuing legal education, they had to have a certification in the beginning, 
And one thing that was sticky in this particular issue was that there was a need to include lay people as mediators. And the bar itself was antagonistic toward that idea, that if we were going to have legal commissions, they needed to be for lawyers. And um, that it took some careful manip manipulation and discussion and compromise to um, adjust to that concept, but we did it. And I think it was the right thing to do. The Tennessee Supreme Court Historical Society. Oh, our love. I was a charter member of that society and worked with people like Charlie Warfield and Val Sanford and many others, Andy Bennett. I mean, it was just, it was so thrilling because I, I really love the Supreme Court building and the Supreme Court, the institution itself. And we, need, we didn't have a written history of the Supreme Court. And it was decided that James Ely would be invited to author it or be the primary author and that others, he, he couldn't be responsible for the entire text. But others were commissioned to write various sections of that book. And it's a book that we can be very proud of. I was watching an interview of um, Charlie Warfield last week, and his firm was so proud of him and the role he played in that that they gave him a framed copy of the book that hangs uh -huh. on his wall, and he's very proud of that. But when you serve on these commissions or in these societies or associations, you rub shoulders with people that you would never come in contact with because our businesses would never um, converge. And so it just enriches your life to be around people who are so famous and so talented and so willing to give of their time too. So my time is no more, it's certainly not as valuable as theirs. And if, if they wanted me to serve with them, well, I wasn't going to miss the opportunity. The Board of Professional Responsibility. Yes, I, I served once before for I think a six year term. And then when um, Russ Parks assumed a real leadership position in the Board of Professional Responsibility, he contacted me and asked me if I would do it again. And I said, oh, Russ, I don't know if I have time to do that. And he said, we need people that understand the practice of law. We, have, we don't need young people who haven't lived the life and you know, walked the walk and understand the pressures and the um, dilemmas that, um, that lawyers face. And so because at his persuasion, I'm now another, on another hearing panel. And it takes a considerable amount of time, but it's worth it every time. The Tennessee Bar Foundation. Oh my goodness, <laughs> well here we are. <laughs> That's just a it's, a, it's a foundation to which you have to be invited to join. And um, we, I think we support provide a very valuable service to the bar, and um, I'm very complimented to be a part of this interview for the foundation. Um, I am going to just read for the record uh, a few of your extracurricular activities, oh, your no. civic activities, because I, I think they're so outstanding and, and so impressive. Um, you have been through Leadership Murray and Tennessee Leadership. The Murray County Kiwanis Club elected you the Citizen of the Year. You were a charter board member of the Murray County YMCA. Uh, you've been an officer of the Kiwanis Club. Um, 
uh, you have been uh, active in uh, church and religious and charitable organizations, King's Daughters, the Episcopal Church Women at your church, and historical organizations, the James K. Polk Memorial Auxiliary. And you have authored an article on Mrs. James K. Polk for publication at Salem College in North Carolina and authored a booklet called A Walk with James K. Polk. Uh, so you are, you're obviously interested in history and, and you're a person of faith and uh, a person of, of great um, civic pride and, and dedication. And uh, I want to ask, what has drawn you to these things? Well, the walk with James K. Polk um, came about because, because I love the Polk home. I maintained its, er, I maintained an herb garden there for years until we ran out of water, um, and it's the only resident, a place where James K. Polk actually lived, remaining. Everything else has been torn down, so we feel a special responsibility to preserve it and maintain it, and um, we have we have some great plans in the in the works now for it if it'll but everything depends on budget. Um, I also researched and marked 75 homes for the Association for the Preservation of Tennessee Antiquities, called APTA, because it hadn't been done in so many years and needed to be updated. And you just did the, I, all I did was do the research and verify it, and then the prison made the, the prisoners and made the signs. and. I just had to get somebody to stick them in the ground in some concrete. It was very interesting to do. I learned a lot about my community that way. So most of these things that I've participated in have really been for my self to, to, to learn what has been going on in my community. It's really selfish that I wanted to I wanted to know and and be assured that the information that I re gathered was um, accurate. Well, you have a record, an astonishing record of contributions and accomplishments. So I must ask, how have you done all this? How have you fit all this in? Do you ever sleep? Do you ever eat? Uh, Besides oh, having a brilliant look mind, look at me, I eat. <laughs> besides having a brilliant mind and a kind and generous spirit, um, how do you do it? Well, I'll agree with the kind spirit. <laughs> Out of all you've said, the rest of it is um, not deserved. Uh, I didn't do it all at once. I moved to. Columbia when I was 23 years old, and I'm 71 now. I've had a long time to do these things. So, you know, you balance. Mm -hmm. You can't neglect your family to go mark 100-year-old homes. Um, can't neglect your family to do any of these things. You have to balance, and some you just prioritize. And this is spread out over a number of years, and with things that I was interested in, and that I have thoroughly enjoyed participating in, and I'm the better for it. Um, one very special act of generosity that, uh, that you have provided is to donate an automated external defibrillator to the Murray County Courthouse. Please tell us how that came about, what inspired you to do that, and what, what from your own past resonated that led you to donate that? I was entering the courthouse after lunch and looked up, I think they're about 12 or 14 steps before you get up to the landing where they have the security equipment. And I saw a man fall to the floor. Of course, they're marble and hard. And he fell hard. And he was a witness, a reluctant witness in a case that was being tried on the first floor, I later found out. And the court officer came around the corner and immediately started CPR. And it seemed like forever before the firemen got there, but they were getting there as fast as they could. And the, um, they were not able to revive the gentleman. And the 
everyone was hollering, where's the AED, where's the AED, we need an AED, and they were waiting on the firemen to get there with one. And ambulance, and you never know where people are, you know, where those agencies are located at the time they get the call, so it does take some time sometimes. But my father had died on the side of a road in Montgomery, right across the street, actually, from the Air Force Base. And Mother couldn't resuscitate him. And I didn't know we didn't have one in the courthouse. So later that day, I went to see the county mayor, and I told him how disturbed I was about that and that I didn't know we didn't have one. He said, none of the offices have them. And I said, well, if you will allow me, I'd like to get one, order one, have you order one, and let's place it here in the courthouse so that this never happens again. It might not save a person's life, but we'd have the satisfaction of knowing that we had a piece of equipment that was designed to save his life and that it was used properly. And so he agreed to let me um, provide that AED, and it's now we have a heart on the front door of the courthouse, oh. and we have a big heart above the AED, and we have, I think, 12 people already trained to use it in the courthouse itself. And I hope our goal is to train others in the surrounding city and county office buildings to use it, because it is portable. All you have to do is unlock it and, and mm -hmm. take it off, and it can be there in a matter of minutes. So I was I was very pleased to be allowed to do that. Well, you, you received justly deserved recognition for that. My next to the last question is going to be, is there anything else that you would like to tell us about that I have not asked you today? Is there any wisdom you would like to share or experiences you would like to share for posterity? I think I've shared all my wisdom <laughs> so, that I could so far. It, it would have been very difficult for me to have done this extemporaneously um, without your asking the questions that you have. And I think you've been very thorough. I appreciate this opportunity. Well, it's, it's been a distinct privilege. Um, to have done this at all and especially to have had the honor of doing it with you. Uh, let me ask finally how you want to be remembered as a person and as a lawyer. What is your legacy? I'd like to be, I, I hadn't thought about that, I'd like to be known as a good lawyer who did my duty, performed my duties, um, even when they weren't particularly popular to the general population, that I, I did what I thought was right and that I represented competently my clients um, and that I treated them with dignity, human, common human dignity, and left at them with some sense of hope for the rest of their life, no matter what they had done. Well, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you, and thank you for your friendship of many years, and I look forward to many more years of friendship and professional, being professional colleagues together. Thank, thank you, you this, so much, Claudia. This has been an extraordinary experience for me. I never, I, I don't, I didn't deserve it, but I'm, Happy to have participated enough.